The passage today was chosen because I heard a sermon preached on it on Sunday and I was so upset by what I heard that I realized I needed to go through and unpack a little bit about what we have here in Matthew chapter 3. Now I'm also writing a blog post about my experience with the church where I where I heard the message on this and so you're welcome to check that out. I'll include a link below. So here in Matthew chapter 3, I will probably be providing some sense of contrast between what I heard and what I see here. And to introduce you to what I heard, I heard Matthew chapter 3 used to make a case for Christian exceptionalism. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, who are here in this section, were used to refer to people who were not Christians, instead of recognizing that these are the teachers of the law, these are the religious people of their day. In other words, whatever is addressed to them, we ought to think of it as being addressed to the religious church people of today. That was completely overlooked, and so um, what John said to the Pharisees and Sadducees was said of everyone who is not a Christian, and so my, my little rant is going to be over there. Let's, uh, let's begin at the beginning and take a look at this. We're, we're in the very beginning of the book of Matthew, so this is the first of the books of the New Testament. And this is when God is beginning to speak to the people again. If we look just before Matthew, you have the book of Malachi, and Malachi is promising to send a messenger of the Lord who will prepare the way before me. And... Who can endure the day of the coming of the Lord of hosts? So we, we have this prophecy that something is going to happen. God is going to send a messenger, and then one is going to follow this messenger who is a refiner, a purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi. And if we think uh, back to the Old Testament, the sons of Levi are the family of Moses. This is the family that was charged with offering sacrifices, and the priests also came from the tribe. Of Levi. So these were all the people who were dedicated to representing God in the nation of Israel. These were the people who dedicated their lives to the service of the temple. These are the ones who would be refined like gold and silver. And if we know anything about refining gold and silver, it takes a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, a lot of fire in particular. Ah, the offerings of Judah will draw near you for judgment. So this word judgment is going to come in again in uh, the book of Matthew when we turn back over there. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, adulterers, those who swear falsely, those who oppress the hired worker, all of this. All right, so I, I didn't come in here to unpack the book of Malachi. But just to give you this concept, Malachi, this is the last of the Old Testament prophets. Matthew, first of the New Testament writers. And in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. I actually want to go find out where this came from. And here we have the handy cross references. We have something for John cited from Isaiah 40, verse 3. Let's take a look at that and see what it says. Because Matthew is introducing John the Baptist, who this chapter is about, by making a reference to Isaiah, who is one of the major prophets here in the Old Testament. What is the role of this messenger? Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Wow. And uh, let's, let's take a look at 39. So context of this, envoys from Babylon... Okay, interesting. So Babylon has not yet captured the city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah is a good king. And let's consider if chapter 40 is written at the same time as chapter 39, or very close by. This is interesting. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So something has happened. Some sort of tragedy has happened. Assumes the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. It looks like the notes on this chapter indicate that this would have been when the people of Israel were in exile. 
So you have a big shift of days between 39 and 40 if that's the case. But let's, let's move on to verse 3, which is what Matthew is citing. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Man, I'm an English teacher. Look at this. A voice cries, colon, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So it is in the wilderness that the way of the Lord is going to be prepared. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So in the wilderness and in the desert, the way of the Lord is going to come from these empty and barren places. Kind of reminds me of the uh, <laughs> the beginning. We gotta we gotta go back to Genesis, and and honestly, this is this is how my Bible studies go all the time. They're they're all over this book because. This book, the Bible, is absolutely incredible because you can't understand one part of it without knowing what all of the other parts are. You can start at kind of a surface level, but you begin to go deeper and deeper and deeper and realize how much this story is interconnected with ourselves, well, with itself and with our lives today. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Formless and void. This is kind of what people thought about the wilderness in that day. Kind of what people thought about the desert. These were empty places. These were places that were not full of life. And this is going to be where the way of the Lord comes from, and the highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the uneven ground shall become plain, the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. All right, so this is the context. When somebody hears or, or reads Matthew, or when Matthew is writing, that's going to be what he's thinking about here in chapter 3 when he's referring to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I'm fascinated, though, by where the colon is placed here. I, I you know, back in Isaiah, remember, the voice cries, colon, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So I wonder if this was a purposeful placement by Matthew or if this was something that kind of came down to us in, in, in translation. So it, it changes the meaning a little bit because when you have the voice of one crying in the wilderness, you're looking for who is out there crying in the wilderness. When it's a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare, you're looking at where the preparation happens. And so Matthew is linking both the voice and the location. And this is John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So he is out there. He is speaking a word. You remember at the very beginning, and, and uh, the book of John highlights this as well, in the beginning, God speaks. In the beginning was the word, is how, how John puts it. And so in those days... He came preaching in the wilderness. There is a word in the wilderness that is saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent is understood as the changing of one's mind. This is you're going one direction, let's go another. Why should you change your mind? And what should you repent of? Again, he's in the wilderness. So who's in the wilderness to listen? He's in Judea. Who lives in Judea? It's the Jewish people. So he's coming to the Jewish people saying, change your minds for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is it that needs to change? Perhaps we will find out in the rest of this chapter. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said. So the prophet Isaiah is talking about comfort to people who have been in exile. This is so fascinating because it's totally different than um, how I heard this preached. I didn't hear anything about comfort to people who are in exile. But this is how Matthew is framing this whole chapter. He's framing it with Isaiah, this comfort. Comfort ye my people, because God has seen you and he's going to come rescue you. Like, you are exiles, but guess what? There's going to be hope. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The Lord is coming to you. And I think this is what it means by the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is wherever the king rules. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt about his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now I went and took a look at these things, and interesting enough, um, in the book of Leviticus, 
which we're not going to turn to just for the sake of time, uh, and the amount of detail that's there. The, there's one chapter there that spends, I don't know how many verses, on locusts and which ones you're allowed to eat and which ones you're not allowed to eat. So camels and locusts are both kind of these borderline clean, unclean creatures, and it's really hard to tell whether one is or isn't. And so my guess is that this would have been really concerning to these people, the Pharisees and Sadducees, who were the teachers of the law. They would be the ones who unpacked Leviticus for everyone and told them which locusts they were allowed to eat and not. So John's out there kind of on the edges of religion and society as well. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. Why? You get a crazy man who eats locusts and wild honey out by a river in the wilderness. And, and it, first of all, people didn't go camping in the wilderness back in those days. The wilderness was a place that you didn't go unless you were outcast or outlawed. You wanted to be around other people in your town, in your city. Wilderness was dangerous. It was a place you went if you wanted to risk death. So they're all going out to him and they were baptized by him in the River Jordan confessing their sins. So they hear this message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and they respond by being baptized in the river and confessing their sins. Hmm. Interesting response. When you think about comforting a return from exile, going to be baptized. What I'm thinking about right here, um, Remember how we mentioned a little bit of clean and unclean with camel's hair and locusts? This was in terms of food. But the way that a person would cleanse themselves ritually in the Old Testament was through water. They had to wash themselves with water in order to be clean. Confessing their sins is an interesting piece, though. I think I'm not going to understand this for a little while longer. We'll have to uh, read further. But when John saw many, many Look, a lot of the Pharisees and Sadducees were coming to his baptism. He said to them. So um, let's also look at this phrase, his baptism, because later on, Jesus refers to the baptism of John. So in other words, when, when somebody baptizes you, they're baptizing you into some tradition, into some way. And so I'm curious what it is that John is baptizing people into. And here we have verse 11 answers that question. I baptize you with water for repentance. So he's baptizing people into repentance. He's saying now is the time to change, to repent, to remember the promise. And I'm guessing that's what some people were coming in and confessing their sins for. I'm guessing that a lot of people had lost hope 400 years after the prophet Malachi had been teaching. But John says to these religious teachers, you a brood of vipers. Now, vipers are the particular kind of snake that if it bites you, they inject poison into your veins and you die. So this is quite an insult. Who warned you to flee, to flee from the wrath to come? Kind of reminds me of God's word to Eve. Who told you that you were naked? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Ah, we well, think about the prophets and the symbolism of trees. We have, we have a lot of imagery here just in, in, in these verses. The first one I'm jumping to is trees because I love trees. And there's oftentimes back in, the, uh, in prophetic language, Israel is sometimes referred to as a tree. And we have also in the book of Romans, you have Christians referred to as being grafted into the tree of Judaism. You have Jesus talking about the vine and the branches. And again, Jesus' message is similar to John's that... Whatever does not bear fruit is going to be cut off. And the axe being laid to the root of the trees is very interesting. That's going to be something to look at a little bit further because I think there's, there's something significant to this. We're focusing on the root, not on the trunk, right? Usually the axe is focused on the trunk, but here's the root. And then good fruit. 
good fruit, in this case, must be fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, repentance is not an end in itself. Repentance means change. Repentance means something new. It's something different. It doesn't mean go to this thing in particular. Repentance is not an outcome. Repentance is a process. So John's basically saying, let's get moving. You guys are stuck. You're not bearing fruit. Nothing is flowing through you right now. So, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So there's wrath to come, and, and here's, where, here's where I really got upset with the preaching, because the person who unpacked this on Sunday focused this entire idea of wrath to come on people who were not saved. When, if they had been John the Baptist, they would have been focused on the people who were sitting right there in the pews. So... They weren't, they weren't totally totally off, except that the target audience was wrong and they, they failed to capture the significance of this chapter. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. And this is why I say Christian exceptionalism was the key problem, is because for a lot of people, we say God is our father. We'll go back to God. We don't even go back to Abraham, which we should because we're grafted onto this tree of the promise of Abraham because it was to Abraham that the promise child was, uh, that, the, that the child was promised. And we're going to go back and look at this just really quick because this is, this is key. There is some sense of exceptionalism to Abraham, but the exceptionalism is that God would bless Abraham and make his name great so that you will be a blessing I will bless those who bless you and who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the exceptional part of the Jewish people. This is also the exceptional part of the Christian people who are grafted onto this promise to Abraham through Jesus, who was that offspring through whom all the nations were blessed. So big theological overarching story, but back into the text. You have a group of people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the Christians I worshipped with on Sunday, saying, we have Abraham as our father. And that was the important point for them. They're like, this is who we are. We're already in. And John the Baptist is saying, look at the fruit. What is coming out of your life? What is the fruit in keeping with repentance? What is the fruit of recognizing the kingdom of heaven is at hand? How would someone live if the king was coming, if they knew that God was at work, if they believed this idea of comfort and restoration was present, they would probably be doing something different than saying, well, so good, so glad we're God's people. He's saying, really, you're no better than stones. God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. He's saying there's nothing special about saying identify as the right person. What is important is that there is fruit coming. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So here we have people who are being baptized with water and confessing their sins. You have one coming after who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. I'm wondering, you know, did people understand what John the Baptist was meaning when he said the Holy Spirit, right? Remember, uh, as, as Christians, like if we unpack this unfolding story, we don't really meet the Holy Spirit until the book of John, like near the end when Jesus is saying, I'm going to send a spirit of truth to you. And the Holy Spirit or this, this, this power of the Holy Spirit doesn't really come until you see it appear in tongues of fire, <laughs> on the heads of the disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Uh, but uh, I, I feel like I'm still, I'm still ranting because, see this word fire here? As soon as we got to that passage, the preacher was all about hell. But that doesn't seem to be what the passage is talking about. This is a baptism of repentance. This is a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. This is a renewal. This is a refining. If we remember... Um, back in Isaiah, which is, which is helping to frame our understanding of this passage, it was talking about refining gold and silver. What does it take to refine gold and silver? Fire. We move into another picture example of what this person is who's coming after John. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So remember we're talking about fruit, right? Fruit in keeping with repentance. You have the whole tree, and then you have the fruit. Here you have this whole stalk of wheat, and stalks of wheat have all these little wheat berries on the top, and the wheat berries have casing on them. So when you harvest wheat, you grab the whole stem, because wheat is, is a grass, and you carry it into a flat area, and then you would beat it with a, um, I don't know if you'd beat it with a winnowing fork, you'd beat it with a flail. And that causes the husk that is around the wheat berry to come off. And then the wheat berry is kind of there on the ground. And because it's hard, it doesn't break with the flail. Only the chaff breaks. So you have the straw, and you have the chaff, and you have the wheat. So you have these three things that all come from a single stalk of grain. And we're looking at this, and he is going to clear his threshing floor. I wonder his threshing floor. I'm, I'm reminded of a, of a picture of the angel of the Lord standing on this threshing floor back in the days of David the king. Interesting. I'm not going to go into that too much, but possible imagery connection right there. Gather his wheat into the barn, and the chaff he will burn. But the wheat and the chaff both come from the same plant. So here the preacher was making a distinction and saying, oh, the Christians are the wheat and the non-Christians are the chaff they're going to burn. Well, how about look at your life? Because again, where we're, we're talking about I baptize you, it looks as though we have something going on an individual basis. There is a choice that each person gets to make to bear fruit and to repent because those who are not repentant are going to be cut off and burned with fire. That part of you which is not changing, that part of you which is stuck, that part of you which is not expecting the kingdom of heaven to be at hand, that's the part that gets burned away, that's the part that gets destroyed. And if your whole life is built around that nothingness, this lack of fruit, there's nothing in keeping with repentance, then whenever the harvest of your life comes, like, what is left when the chaff is taken away? Is there any wheat also growing? And I think this is this is the whole this is the whole idea. And John is super upset with the Pharisees and Sadducees because they weren't allowing any wheat to grow. They had all this appearance, all this casing, but there was no substance. There was no fruit on the inside. They had all of the law on the outside. They had it all right. <sighs> Kind of, a, kind of a really powerful message here in chapter 3. Let's, let's keep moving just a little bit further because all of this is the setup for the last part of the chapter, the baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him. Okay, this is interesting. Jesus came to experience the baptism of John. Remember the baptism of John is one of repentance. Jesus came to participate in that baptism. He came to identify as one who repented. That's kind of a fascinating statement, isn't it? John would prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. John gets it, and after all, John is the cousin of Jesus, so these two have been friends growing up. And right now, as we know, Jesus is about 30 years old. John is probably 30 or 31, somewhere in there. So these two men standing in a river, Jesus saying, hey, I want to be part of this movement, like, I want you to baptize me, and John saying, no, I need to be baptized by you, do you come to me? But Jesus answered to him, and I think this is going to be really important, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. This is fitting for us to fulfill it's almost like Jesus knew he was taking part in a dance of some kind, like he was participating in something that was choreographed in advance. Almost like maybe Jesus had read the book of Isaiah. Maybe. He probably read the book of Malachi, too. Um, we have the story of Jesus in the temple with the teachers of the law when he was 12 years old. And I think a lot of us look at how he was able to talk with them as being, oh yeah, of course, he was God. He wrote the Bible. 
Um, but there's also this aspect of Jesus being human and studying and being related to the high priest. After all, um, he was he was somebody who would have had access to study the law, perhaps even with the former high priest, um, even with John the Baptist's father, Zachariah. He could have potentially studied with him. One doesn't know. But here Jesus says, let us fulfill all righteousness. That's an interesting quote. I, I feel like you know, every time I, I dive into one of these, there's so much more to discover. But John consents to Jesus and says, all right, I'll baptize you. It's like Jesus is honoring the work of John. He's saying, there's the voice. You're preparing the way of the Lord. And John is like, with his hands, with his body, with his work here is preparing the way of the Lord. And when Jesus was baptized, baptized by John, baptized into repentance to bear fruit in keeping with good works, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. Though the little note here says some manuscripts omit the to him. It could be that the heavens were opened he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Now what is, oh my gosh, what is the imagery of the dove? We look at the dove as being the sign of peace. So when I, when I heard this passage on Sunday, it sounded like it was a passage of preparing for war and an us versus them. And these are the ones who are going to be destroyed by the judgment of God. And look at context. If you just look at the historical documents that the author would be appealing to, that Jesus was referencing, that John was thinking about, you understand a completely different message here than what you would have gotten if you went to church with me on Sunday. Heavens were open. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Ah, the Spirit of God. Remember? So one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to have to have the Holy Spirit in order to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, descending like a dove, resting on him. And, and to rest, to dwell, to remain. This was the idea of the tabernacle. This was the imagery in the Old Testament that God wanted to rest, to dwell among his people. This is the Sabbath idea. This is this notion of rest. And behold, a voice. Wow. Now we're going all the way back to the book of Genesis. Remember, it's the voice that speaks. In the beginning was the word. And, and the word proceeds from God. The voice, the original source. This voice that speaks into the darkness and light is. A voice from heaven says. Now... <sighs> Here's another connection. A voice, the voice. John the Baptist has a voice. Jesus submits to that voice. He emerges from the water, and here is another voice. This is a voice from heaven, and it doesn't say anything except it's a voice from heaven. It's not identified who this voice is, what the voice is doing. Uh, we presume it's God. But I think the best way we can make this connection is that this voice is the same voice that was speaking in the very beginning. Remember, voice is symbolic. Voice is this, is this picture, and we have voice in the context of wilderness and void creating. What is this voice from heaven creating with these words? This voice is saying this. This is my beloved son. My beloved son. Wow. You know, if, if you're God, this, this, I think, is the one time that you have a voice from heaven speaking. In all of the days of Jesus, right? I, I can't think of another one right now. If you're going to have one line that you speak, what's it going to be? I would say this is perhaps one of the most important lines in the entire Gospels. 
This is the one time we have a voice speaking into human history from heaven. And what did this voice say? This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. I really want to go into that further because I don't think I, like, I get lost sometimes along the way. And every time I go back and pray and I say, God, am I doing the right thing? Am I going the right direction? Like, what do you want me to do? The answer is always. Are you experiencing my love? I think that's related to this. With whom I am well pleased, the Son. Well, I put that in with the comfort, comfort ye my people, because the Lord has seen and will return the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does the kingdom begin with? The kingdom doesn't begin with war. The kingdom doesn't begin with the Pharisees and Sadducees, the teachers of the law. The kingdom doesn't even begin with John, who is baptizing for repentance. The kingdom begins with the Son this relationship of humanity to God. When we remember that we are children of God, then we are at the gateway of the kingdom. And I think that's what repentance means. I think that means to change your mind to remember who you are. You are a son of God. 